obviously turn back to John chapter 4. We're going to be focusing especially this morning on verses 31 to 38, uh, where Jesus just speaks with his disciples. It's this little snippet in the midst of the narrative where Jesus is dealing with the woman of the well and then the people from the town uh, in Samaria who come out to him uh, and they, they speak, or rather Jesus speaks with them uh, and he's dealing with them again. Uh, we're told at the beginning of the reading that we had in verse 27 that the, G- the disciples returned. Uh, remember the disciples had gone into the town uh, to go and buy some food. Uh, they'd been travelling. Uh, they didn't have cool packs or things like that. They couldn't go call a, an Uber or delivery. Uh, they needed to go and find stuff on the way. Uh, and Jesus, as he sends them into the town, deals with a woman. And uh, we thought about that a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> Uh, But now Jesus is also actually going to deal with his disciples. It's almost an unspoken thing, uh, but when you look there in verse 27, uh, we're told that the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Uh, But no one said, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Uh, The implication is no one asked those questions, but they're there. And again, why is Jesus talking with this person? You know, it would have been unusual for a Jewish male to be seen talking publicly with a single female, let alone a single Samaritan female. Uh, and maybe even as, they, we, as we thought about, as you see this woman, she's coming out in the middle of the day, which is, un, which is unusual. Uh, maybe they're aware that there is some social stigma around her. We certainly saw that. Uh, Jesus points out to her back in verse 17 and 18. He says that her life has been one of turmoil and brokenness. And there is even things that at present are wrong within it. Uh, It just raises a whole number of questions in the disciples' minds of why her? And yet we know obviously this was a God-appointed meeting. Jesus went to meet her deliberately. Because God has a heart for those who are troubled, those whose lives are not perfect. In fact, that is the definition of everyone who's a Christian. We know that our lives are not perfect. We know that we needed Jesus. And yet sometimes we can look at people and go, yeah, but that person, really? And Jesus is going to now deal with the disciples about this. Jesus, we need to know, had the authority to speak to everyone, obviously. I mean, he's the creator. He made everyone. That there isn't anyone that he could look at and go, you are unworthy, or, or, or I have no business in talking with you. Actually, we also need to remember, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus, at the end of the Gospels, gives to his disciples the authority to speak to anyone about him. Uh, you can talk with Jesus, or talk with anyone, sorry, about Jesus from your very first meeting with him. You don't need to gain credit or build space or create time. Jesus gave authority that his people will speak about him freely at any point. And and, And this passage here this morning actually gives us the backdrop to that. The reason why Jesus gave that authority to his disciples and by implication to the church as it carries on as well. Jesus is very clear here, and there are some familiar pictures that we'll be uh, picking up on uh, together this morning. But the first thing, as we think about this, is that we're going to see that there is that he is nourished. He's nourished. I mean, you can imagine, can't you, the disciples' surprise. They, they turn up knowing that Jesus didn't have any food. They've gone and bought food. They bring it back to Jesus, and they say to Jesus there in verse 31... Rabbi, eat something. Teacher, eat something. Look what we've got for you. And Jesus turns around to him in verse 32 and says, I have food that you know nothing about. And they're left scratching their heads. Now, did someone come and bring Jesus food whilst we weren't here? Did did that woman walk out past us to the well as we were on our way in? Did did she have some bit of food that had just been completely unexplained? Did did, you know? did a, did, a, did a trade route go by? Now, where is Jesus' food? Now, Jesus actually here isn't talking about physical food, is he? He's talking about a spiritual food. 
Uh, this isn't to say, by the way, uh, that you know, not eating is a good position. You know, you're a holier person if you just restrict yourself and you just go, I'm just eating spiritual stuff all today. That's not the way it works. We do need physical food, and Jesus certainly ate physical food at various points. And we're told about that frequently, told about that through the Gospels. But Jesus here is using a spiritual language. Just as he spoke to the woman about water in a spiritual way, he's also using food here in a spiritual sense. The water, Jesus spoke about at the beginning of the chapter, uh, is where he's, he's talking about you know, how Jesus has the, has, has the water of life. He has something that can quench the, the thirsting of a soul to be right with God. The food, though, that Jesus is talking about here is particularly the satisfaction, the enjoyment, and even the energy that comes, spiritually at least, from doing what God has given you to do. Jesus says there, doesn't he, there in verse 34, he says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish this work. She said, this is what I've been feeding on. I've been feeding on the fact that I've been doing what God has sent me to do. Jesus knew his mission. Uh, his mission was to come to be the saviour of the world. It was to save sinners, to bring people into that right relationship with God through repentance and faith. That is what this woman has begun to do. She says, this is the food that I'm that is going to sustain me. This is what's going to nourish me. This is what excites me. This gives a, a spiritual energy and life beyond physical food. Jesus was satisfied. He was nourished. He was fed spiritually, by the from what he says here in the passage, by doing what God had sent him to do. He was pleased. There was a joy in Jesus doing the work that was intended for him. The joy that Jesus took in serving God was going to be a joy like nobody else's because as Jesus served God, he pleased the Father. The Father's love is then is poured out more on Jesus. In fact, when Jesus gets to you know, creep praying uh, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane in John chapter 17, uh, verse 4, he, he shows us he's been acutely aware that everything he's been doing has been for the service of God. He, he says that, I have accomplished the work that you gave me to do. The whole time, Jesus was all about doing the work of the Father. In, in many senses, Jesus is actually living out in the highest form something that has been written in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. One that Jesus comes to quote in John chapter in John chapter six. It's written Deuteronomy chapter eight verse three: Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus is fed and sustained as he does what God tells him to do. Actually. Do we find a satisfaction? Do we find an enjoyment? Do we find it enlivening? Doing what God has commanded us to do. Now, that's not always the case that you know, God's commanded you to go and do the food shopping for the day or commanded you to go into your, your office for the day or commanded you to go and clean the car. But he has commanded us to take care of our, of our, of our families commanded us to work. He's commanded us to, to, to serve. He's commanded us to, to love. He's commanded us to fellowship. He's commanded us to be careful with our resources. Whether you realise it or not, those are commands given by God and they're good for us to do. But especially, I think, when Jesus is talking here, he's talking about the work of bringing this lady into the kingdom of God. He's talking especially about evangelism. Um, pointed out, you know, as, we've, uh, as we know, he said it before, Gareth's going on beach mission, it's not a holiday. I do remember various times that lead, when you're leading two-week beach missions, it gets to usually about the Tuesday of the second week, uh, having had to wrangle with all kinds of things that have gone on during the week. Um, 
even unfortunately sometimes team members and relationships that do or don't crop up between team members that's always just a nightmare when you're dealing with teams and leading beach missions you get to tuesday evening and i always just found just physically just exhausted just everything grinding and wearing down and, and then you look at what you're doing well, actually, today, what have we had? Well, we had 20, 30 kids sat on the beach, and we had, they, they came and asked us questions, and so-and-so this evening, you know, in the open air, they shared their testimony in the open air for the first time, and you, you start counting up the ways in which you've been able to serve God, and the team have been honouring God. Well, okay, I can do at least one more day. And you carry on and get, hopefully it's more than that, but you, can, you, you get to the end of the week as a, as a, as a team leader, but it's... But there is something about seeing and being involved in the direct work of God that is exciting. Hopefully those of you who have been in Spotlight and Engage, those of you who have helped with the Holiday Club, those of you who have been involved in ministries at different points over the years, hopefully you've seen and have felt a sense of something like that. There is an excitement, isn't there, in being involved in the work of God, in reaching out, especially in reaching out, I think, to those round about us, of proclaiming the Lord Jesus, of seeing people engaging and drawing near and after the Lord Jesus Christ. It's exciting. It encourages you to carry on. Now, uh, whether you, those of you involved in Spotlight have, have just, you know, at the end of it, and you need a break over the August, that's, that's why we're going to give you one. We don't expect you just to carry on indefinitely. But do we find it the, 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 the work that we've been able to do for God, in whatever way it might be, has it excited you? Has it given you a joy? Has it encouraged you to carry on? Okay, maybe after a break, but has it encouraged you to carry on? Or do you look at everything you do and just go, oh, it's just such a drag? Jesus says, I... I have a food that you can't see. It's a spiritual food that encourages me to carry on and to be engaged. Uh, one of the things that uh, Gordon, uh, who went to be with the Lord at the beginning of the year, uh, often said to me was that he was constantly praying that Ian would be encouraged and sustained through his ministry. But as Ian laboured, he would be encouraged by seeing the work of God that it might be, that it might nourish him to, to carry on. So what ministries do you currently have? Maybe here in the church, yes, but also just in your own personal lives and working amongst the church as well. One of the group leaders were involved in ministry in one way. And pastors, elders of churches as well, but shouldn't shouldn't be being moaners of churches, but should be encouraged and deliberately taking time to see that the blessings that God is doing among the people. Are you raising a family? Are you training them the right way to live? That is part of the ministry that God has given to you. Are you encouraged in that? Okay, there's going to be ups and downs, aren't there? There's always going to be challenges in parenting. But are you are you are you, do you find that exciting, seeing them grow in their understanding or at least their knowledge of God? Are you involved in caring among the fellowship? Are you, are you encouraged as you see people being strengthened by their, with their, in their faith uh, as you seek to minister to them in whatever capacity that might be when they're at low, their lowest points? You have a ministry of prayer. Are you encouraged by as you see your prayers being answered? Does it, does it give you a life, a spiritual life to carry on? What about, you know, do you have a ministry of being an encourager? Or a ministry of discipling and helping to train and equip further the saints and create other Christians here to serve God in an ongoing sense? It should be exciting for us to see Certainly people becoming Christians, but also to see one another going on with God, growing in our relationships with God, seeing that spiritual work, being eyewitnesses to the very you know, heart work of God, of drawing people to the Lord Jesus and making his people more like him. 
Jesus was nourished by doing that spiritual work. Are you? Or have you forgotten to look at it? Have you forgotten to see what God is doing? Have you forgotten that there should be an enjoyment in serving God and it's just become a burden? Well, then maybe the question becomes, are you doing it for the serving God or are you doing it for yourself? Because ministry done, service done for God is exciting and refreshing and sustaining because it is God's work that we're doing and taking a part in. And secondly, we are to notice. Um, I don't know whether you ever sat down and sort of considered uh, your colleagues or maybe those closest to you in your family or neighbourhood and wondered how likely it is that they might become Christians. And there's a sense in which we probably all do that to, su- to some degree. Or you go, well, they're less likely, so I'm not necessarily going to speak as openly or as oftenly with them about Christ. They're more likely because of their maybe so- tendencies, and so I might do more. Actually, we do something wrong when we think and ever look at people and say, I don't think they'll become a Christian. We dishonour God when we say that because we know there is nothing impossible with God. There is no person who is beyond God's grace. There is no individual who can do so many bad things that there is no hope at all. It's not the weight of sin or the nature of someone's character that necessarily does that. Jesus points this out to the disciples, doesn't he? There in verse 35, uh, Jesus says to them, Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Whether it was four months before harvest time or not, uh, I think the NIV just sort of translates it a little differently and says you have this saying, which I think is probably about the, the helpful sense for it. You know, they were familiar with saying it's not yet time for harvest. It's going to come. It's coming. And Jesus is simply saying to the disciples, you think there's going to be a time coming when there will be an ingathering. People will be drawn in. Jesus is saying to them, it's not just something to come. It's something that's happening now. It's not the the not yet, it's the (laughs) present. Now, we could argue that as Jesus looks at at, at everybody and says, look, everything's ripe for harvest now, we might argue, well, culturally, people were very different in those days, weren't they? There was a much more open spirituality. There were already people looking for the Messiah. Even the Samaritans were looking for God's Messiah. But Jesus doesn't add any sort of caveats onto this. He doesn't say, well, look at the Jews and the the Samaritans, that there are ripe people for harvest. He doesn't even just say, look at this town. Because Jesus knew what was going to happen. Look at this town. This is a town that's ripe for harvest. No, Jesus says, look at the fields. Take note of where everything is. There is an opportunity for a gathering in, for a harvest for God. And it's not just one to come. It is now, present and continuous. I guess you met, there's a bit of a shock from the disciples as they hear Jesus saying there's going to be a harvest as he stood right in the middle of Samaria. That's certainly going to challenge them. They could have understood it if he'd said, said that probably more easily. He stood in the middle of Galilee. But we all always want to look at that question and go, but is it the same today? You know, Jesus could say it then, and you know, Jesus had thousands of people at different points coming and listening to him. You know, on the day of Pentecost, there were thousands of people who became Christians. You know, the church seemed to explode quickly and, and grow uh, rapidly over, over many years in different countries. Is it still the same today that Jesus can look at the world and say, it's ripe for harvest? 
we tend to go, well, that was back then, wasn't it? Now, there's a lot of brokenness in our world today. People are spiritually much more tuned off. Uh, there's a growing apathy and disinterest. There's the prominence and preference even at times of other religions. There's, there's all kinds of other factors in the way. Jesus didn't say that you know, it's right for harvest right now, but it won't be in 20 years' time. Neither did he give the impression when he commanded the apostles on, on the day that he ascended back up into heaven uh, and told them to go to, to, to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, did he say to them, well, you can expect to find progress for the first 2,000 years, but then after that, it's going to be really hard going for the church. Jesus said, there's going to be a harvest. That's why when John, Jesus begins his ministry in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand now. Why should we look at our culture around about us? Why should we look at the people and say, this could be a great harvest? Why could Jesus look at the world and say, there is, the, the fields are ripe? I think there's two things. Firstly, we don't know, do we, how the, how the Holy Spirit is working among people and individuals. I mean, you just look, cast back your eyes to, to the beginning of, of John chapter 3. Uh, if you just turn over the page to, to, back to John chapter 3, uh, verse 7, Jesus here speaks about the Holy Spirit. And he says, You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit in someone's heart is often a secret thing. It is not something that all of us can see at, the, at any given time. It is a private work that God does in the heart of an individual as he draws someone towards the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe, don't we, that when the Lord Jesus went ascended up into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus say the Spirit would do when he came? He would convict, convince, and correct. Now, particularly in the heart of his people, but the Spirit's work is to draw people to Christ. We do not see all the ways in which God is working. That's why, isn't it, there are times where people who become Christians, they seemingly catch us by surprise. People that we hadn't expected or anticipated, or people who maybe you knew them as they were growing up and they looked like the least likely candidates to ever become a Christian because of their lifestyle or the, the, the choices and the decisions that they make. And yet wonderfully, maybe after many years, the Lord deals with them and brings them into his kingdom. But we shouldn't forget God knows what he is doing with people. We, we shouldn't look at people and write them off or discard them. And the other thing is, we also need to remember this, the, the, the gospel hasn't lost its power. Now, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, being who came to die on the cross to save sinners, is the same message that had always been proclaimed through the Bible. Okay, we now have a greater clarity of it. But that has always been God's means and message of salvation. Maybe we were someone, some of those people that, that others would look at and go, it is unlikely that they will become a Christian. What changed you? The work of the Holy Spirit drawing you to the Lord Jesus Christ to believe in the gospel of God. Are we convinced that the gospel is the message that our world still needs to hear today? The message of God's salvation by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ.
it's tragedy that I think today so often Christians begin, have begun to lose their belief that the gospel will work. Try to do all kinds of extra additional things to try to make everybody, make churches look more appealing, or to make Jesus look more popular, or to make God's word more socially acceptable. Jesus looked at the world and said, they're ripe for harvest. What do we do? We do what God tells us. We proclaim God's message. The problem comes is that in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, Jesus said this, that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Maybe one of the reasons why we struggle to see the church growing, or we struggle to see things in terms of harvest, is that actually the, the workers are few. That there are less Christians maybe in the world, that could be a possibility, but maybe there's just less Christians actually be doing the work of proclaiming the gospel. Maybe there's more Christians just content to stay in their own buildings. It's one of the dangers of the church in any given age. Jesus says, notice what the opportunity is. See what could be done. It says there in verse 35, open your eyes and look. Are your eyes, are our eyes closed to the opportunities around about us? Or do we look past others? Do we look past those in our spheres, those in our community? We go, oh, well, the gospel is going to have great impact somewhere else. There's going to be a wonderful harvest somewhere else. Why are, why are we, or aren't we, praying for the work of God to in our ministry here? Or in your ministry, or in your spheres of work? <coughs> Have we forgotten you know, the work of God, the power of the gospel? Because actually the promise in the, in the Bible is that Jesus will continue to save sinners until he comes again. And we shouldn't forget that. And then thirdly, uh, we have network. Uh, Jesus paints a picture of those involved in the work of people becoming Christians. He tells us there in verse, 30, uh, verse uh, 37, he says thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. Uh, there are two types of service in people becoming Christians, sowers and reapers. These are both descriptions, actually, of Christians. And often, Christians at different moments. Uh, it's not just that you're one or the other. Hopefully, everyone is a sower. That is, someone who is constantly showing and displaying Jesus in the things that you say, in the way that you live, in the actions that you take, in the decisions that your life is characterised by, in especially also at times in the, in the fact that you do directly speak about the Lord Jesus Christ to people. Every Christian should be in that category. And there are also going to be those who do reaping. That is, those who are used by God especially to bring people finally to that point of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's nothing mystical really particularly about that. You know, there are people who, who might, and maybe you've had that experience of someone saying to you, I want to become a Christian, what do I do? You, you don't have to sort of stand there and pray special holy prayers over them or something like that. It is simply telling the message of the gospel. It might be at times sitting down with them and helping them to pray to God for themselves. But, but, but there isn't anything that you or I physically do to make someone a Christian. We know that. We tell them the gospel. We encourage, we encourage them to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We might pray with them, but it is about them and their heart. We might have the privilege of being able to of being witness to that very moment when someone finally you know, puts their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and as the, the, the work of God is, is really you know, put in place uh, within their hearts. Do you 
Jesus says there's, there's two different roles, sowing and reaping. Are you sowing as a Christian? Are you displaying, proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, Christians, we are supposed to be, well, you are, whether you really are aware of it or not, a living poster or a living advert for the gospel. Your life is going to show what Jesus does. That's challenging, isn't it? I'm aware of that. We're thankful that we're not doing that on our own, as Robert pointed out last Sunday morning. It is with the help of the Spirit that we live for God. But note there are two roles here the proclaiming and the gathering. There isn't a role, though, of the grower. You know, the one who's there just constantly, you know, feeding uh, the, 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 the soil, the one who's providing the, the sunlight and the rain and everything else. Why? Because the one who gives the increase, which Paul tells us, is God. Our responsibility as Christians is to proclaim Christ, and in some cases we are used by God to be the final means through which someone... You know, we, we're able to prompt someone, encourage someone, direct someone to finally put their uh, fully uh, put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the responsibility of making a crop grow is God. It's the work again of the Spirit in the part of that person as the gospel takes root in their heart as they begin to grow, understand and, and, and grasp what the work of the Lord Jesus is and means and can mean for them when they come to him in faith and repentance. That's why Jesus says there in verse 38, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. And we sow. But many we try and trust that to God. And then God graciously sometimes uses us as the means through which people are then finally brought to him. It is always God who gives the increase. We can't ever say, well, I, I made so-and-so a Christian. We can rejoice over that God used our words, our witness, our ministries, our example. We can rejoice over the fact that God chose to use, that we might have been the tool, the means through which someone became a Christian. But it's all about the work of God in someone's heart. But there's also this element. Jesus says there in verse uh, 38, he says, others have done the hard work, you have reaped the benefits of their labour. As Christians, we are not independent from each other in the work of evangelism. And we're not independent from the church that's gone before, from the saints who have already been called home to rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. The, 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 the work of sowing and growing the church is one that the church throughout every generation part, is part of. And it can be that there are times you know, when one generation you know, faithfully preached the gospel. And it can be that many years later, even after they have been called home, that the ones who they preached the gospel to then become Christians. Or it might be that you share the gospel with someone this coming week. And it'll be in two or three months' time, or three years' time, or three decades' time, when a Christian in another place will be able to, by you know, the Lord's grace, be the one that finally leads them to him in faith. Now, if we want to see a church but carrying on in this country in 30, 40, 50 years' time, we need to be proclaiming the gospel today. We might not always see the fruit of it right now. And there are moments in church history where the church seems to go through lean periods, where there seems to be days of small things. But we shouldn't despise the day of small things. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, in the midst of uh, talking about the growth of the kingdom and, uh, and expansion, uh, Zechariah 4, verse 10 uh, there's this little uh, 
phrase of who dares despise the day of small things. Even if we don't see many people become Christians during this time, during our, our lifetime, we know that God can use and will take and benefit and, and bring blessing through the preaching of his word at a time that suits him and displays his glory the most. What we do know is that often as Christians we can be linked in a chain. And part of that ongoing consistent witness of sowing, of preaching Jesus, proclaiming the gospel, so that there might be a gathering in of those souls in the time to come. And when we look at the world, we, we go, well, there, where, where's the harvest? Well, don't be discouraged. Instead, carry on. Persevere with proclaiming the gospel. Because there will be a harvest at the right time, according to God's plan. There's a man named Clive Williams. He was the longest serving uh, man in the open air mission. He still uh, does occasional uh, work for them in the open air. But he found that towards the end of his uh, ministry with the Open Air Missions, where he was retiring, uh, he had a whole load of people over a series of months come and say to him, Clive, you were preaching in this town 30 years ago. Uh, I became a Christian just last month. It's a long time sometimes. The question is, are we faithful? Are we going to be the faithful ones that continue to proclaim the gospel that can be used and build on the work of those who have already shared it. One of the things that the church needs to at times be aware of and see. Sometimes when a new pastor steps into a place, you know, there's a fresh excitement and enthusiasm and energy. And often it can be the case that you see you know, people suddenly becoming Christians. And there can be an early load of, of baptisms and conversions. And you go, wonderful, it's so encouraging. This is a man who's going to be really blessed by God. Actually, you don't forget. But that gathering there is because of the ministry and the faithfulness that has gone before. It's building on the heritage that has already been established by faithful Christians because of their steadfastness and their obedience to Christ in the years prior to that. So how are you going to be involved in the work, the network of believers? As we work together for the sake of the gospel, sowing and reaping, drawing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. How are you going to do that this week? Are you going to make sure that you have Christ on display in your life? The different ministries that you have and responsibilities and duties. Are you going to, you know, we, we don't know, do we, how the Spirit will work. How he draws. But we, what we can be is convinced that he does and that he will at the right time as he works and deals with people in their hearts. And we need to be praying for that. Uh, as we pray, as we proclaim the gospel, we pray for the work of the gospel. We go hand in hand. And we, tr and we trust that God will give the increase and that we will see his kingdom grow. If you aren't yet a Christian this morning, I, I think I also need to say this to you. As you hear about Jesus, you are going to come to a point where you have to make a decision about Jesus. It's never, it shouldn't be the case that you're just continually gaining knowledge and, and getting an understanding of him so that it just becomes a load of knowledge in your head. There comes a point where you know who Jesus is according to the Bible. And you at that moment, when you understand that Jesus is the saviour of the world who died to deal with your sin, you need to make a decision. Are you going to believe him and trust him? Or are you going to ignore him? We pray that you will come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for yourselves. That you become truly part of the church here in this place. And that we will have the joy of seeing God continuing to work in your life here amongst us too.